And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. And we're so honored that you're joining us for our broadcast this evening. Tonight, our broadcast is entitled, The Return of Animal-Human Hybrids from the Book of Jasher. And we're so very thankful for all of you that are going to be spending this time with us. So, we want to really push the envelope tonight, as we always do. We're going to be looking at things old and things new. We're going to be looking at ancient texts that talk about these things. We're also going to be looking at things that are going on now that we need to be aware of. So fasten your seat belts, put your crash helmet on, grab your popcorn because we are now live, live, live. What's up? NYS TV, Midnight Ride listeners, FOJC listeners. What is up tonight? Hopefully you guys are doing great. David, how are you? I am just very blessed to be here. I'm excited about this show. I'm excited about what God's doing. It's a time when darkness is literally covering our world. But as it says in the prophet Isaiah, that the light of the glory of God will shine on his people in this time. And that's what's happening. God is raising up the remnant and uh, we're going to do mighty exploits through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm excited. Me too. This is always my favorite time of the week when I can get in here and do this. Um, I don't have a commercial to play for you guys for our sponsors, but I'll go ahead and lift up our sponsors and, and let you guys know they do amazing work. Joshua Watts Leather has made some outstanding products for myself and hundreds, if not thousands, of our listeners. Uh, he makes anything from book covers gun holsters to shotgun holsters to uh, you name it, just about bracelets, uh, everything that you can imagine just about. He make guitar, guitar straps. I mean, he can do whatever you have on your mind, and he does a really great job at an amazing artist, joshuawattsleather.com. You can check out the link in the description. Also, the Golden Spool Rules, uh, she makes a lot of homemade products. She's a widow that, that really um, – does her best to serve the kingdom the best way golden rules.com you can check out the link below make sure you guys check them out also uh, we're sponsored by our own website nystv.org where you can find stuff that you can't find on youtube namely because uh, that kind of content is not allowed on youtube and i'm not and it's not bad content to us uh to them it's considered hate speech also we have documentaries on there that you can't find anywhere else um, and we have shows that you can't find anywhere else, a large variety, and we're adding more and more every week, new documentaries coming in. It's a great way to support what we do, and we appreciate it a ton when you guys do support us. We do we, we, appreciate, we do our best, and that's our goal tonight is to do our best to make sure we don't waste your time and you guys get to hear the best thing on Saturday night, which is the Saturday Night Live. There's no doubt the best show on tonight, in my opinion. Hey, I'm a little slanted, but you know. I am too. I could be prejudiced, but I believe so. And if you look out there, uh, there are a lot of shows on transhumanism. There are a lot of shows about animal human hybrids and the things that are going on with genetic corruption. We we're aware of that, but there's not a lot of shows about animal human hybrids from the book of jasher and that's what's going to make this show different tonight it's going to give us cutting edge insight that i don't know 
uh, who else has talked about this. But anyway, we're going to talk about it tonight. So here we go. And we're going to begin. And as to the book of Jasher, I do not hold the book of Jasher to the same high degree that I do the book of Enoch. I would in no wise want to take the book of Jasher to make doctrine out of it or to overturn something in Scripture that would be contrary. But I do believe that it is an ancient book that holds traditions in this book and stories that are true and based in truth. And by taking the book of Jasher, and comparing it with scripture, I believe we can come up with some insight that's going to be very compelling when we look at the return of these animal-human hybrids that we're going to be looking at. So let's begin in the book of Jasher, chapter 36 and verse 20. And his brother Esau and his sons and all belonging to him went to the land of Seir and dwelt there and had possessions in the land of Seir. And the children of Esau were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. Now, something we want to point out here in the beginning of the text, and like I say, we're going to be going from Jasher to the canonical scriptures, and we're going to be comparing and making some very, very interesting comparisons, I guarantee you. But something we want to note here that's very clear, Esau is not Seir. Esau goes into this area of Mount Seir, and it's very important because we're going to see Esau, who was known for making some boneheaded mistakes, wasn't he? He's the guy that sold his birthright. And we're going to see a couple more huge mistakes Esau made that are recorded here in the book of Jasher. And he thought that he could go into this mountain. And we're going to be showing you a lot about what this mountain was like, and it's pretty phenomenal. But this is what we want to observe at the beginning, that when Esau went in to multiply in this mountain, Seir was not one of Esau's descendants. He went into this area. Now, there's an amazing story here recorded in the book of Jasher, and a lot of people they would read this text that we're going to read here, and they might say, well, this is just absolutely crazy, and you might just throw the book of Jasher in the trash, and if that's what you want to do, I mean, that's fine. But in the book of Jasher here, we're going to be taking this text, and we're going to be going to the Word of God, and we're going to say, well, is this possible, or is this just absolutely crazy? crazy. And when we examine the things that the book of Jasher talks about here in the Word of God, we're going to see that, yeah, this is just exactly what we would expect from this crowd. But let's read our text in the book of Jasher chapter 36. And there was a day that he brought them to one of the deserts on the seashore opposite the wilderness of the people. And whilst he was feeding them, behold, a very heavy storm came from the other side of the sea and rested upon the asses that were feeding there, and they all stood still. This reminds me of the book of Job when there was the storm came in and uh, the, the cattle were gone. In verse 31 it says, And afterward about 120 great and terrible animals came out from the wilderness. Now that number 120 is not coincidental. There were 120 on the day of Pentecost. There were 120 priests when Solomon dedicated the temple. And we'll see, this is kind of like Nephilim Pentecost here, uh, what they got going on. It says uh, about 120 great and terrible animals came out from the wilderness at the other side of the sea, and they all came to the place where the asses were, and they placed themselves there. And those animals from their middle downward were in the shape of the children of men. Now, it's interesting here that from the waist down, they were human, which meant that they were capable of of copulating with the human race. And this is a big part 
of the story because this is a continuation of the Genesis 6 scenario. And and those animals from their middle downward were in the shape of the children of men, and from their middle upward some had the likeness of bears and some the likeness of kephas. And don't ask me what a kepha is. As far as I know, this is the only place there's a reference to the kepha. It's some kind of a genetic mutation. And when we see from the story that we're going to be studying tonight, there were so many varieties of these things that they were just constantly uh, coming up with more of these genetic mutations. In the, it says, in the likeness of bears and some the likeness of the kephas with tails behind them from between their shoulders, reaching down to the earth. Like the tails of the duchapoth, another animal that is just some kind of a genetic corruption, and these animals came and mounted and rode upon these asses and led them away, and they went away into this day. So that's a pretty wild story, isn't it? We've got mm-hmm. the 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 guy out there, he's trying to feed his asses, and here come these half bear, half human, all kinds of different creatures, and they come and they get on the asses and ride off with them. Well, what I want to examine tonight, is this just absolutely crazy and beyond the veil of possibility, or is this something that could actually take place according to scripture. Now, we're going to identify some characters here in this next text from the book of Jasher that we're going to be going back to the Word of God and taking a closer look at. And these names are the key to understanding the genetic corruption that was going on in scripture. And in Jasher 36, let's begin in verse 33. And one of these animals approached Anah, who will be identified as the son of Seir the Horite. One of these animals approached Anah and smote him with his tail and then fled from that place. And when he saw this work, he was exceedingly afraid of his life. Well, I guess so. And he fled and escaped to the city and he related to his sons and brothers all that had happened to him. And many men went to seek the asses, but could not find them. And Anon and his brothers went no more to that place from that day following, for they were greatly afraid of their lives. And the children of Anna, the son of Seir, were Deshan, his sister, Ahabalam, ah, Alabama, that's not Alabama. That's Alabama. That's how they say it, though, in Alabama. 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 Well, I probably yep. just said that totally wrong, but there it is. And the children of Dishon were Himda, Eshbon, Ithron, and Chiron. And the children of Ezer were Bilhan, Zaban, Achan, and the children of Dishon were Uz and Aran. These are the families of the children of Seir the Horite. Now we're going to be going to scripture and learning more about Seir the Horite. And we remember as we began, we saw Esau going into Mount Seir, according to their dukedoms in the land of Seir. And Esau and his children dwelt in the land of Seir the Horite, the inhabitant of the land, and they had possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob and his children and all belonging to them dwelt with their father Isaac in the land of Canaan as the Lord had commanded Abraham their father. Now, let's go to Genesis 36 and 1 and let's see what we can learn. Now, these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Now, we're going to be looking at the biblical genealogy of Esau from Scripture. Now, the Scripture says here, Now, these these are the sons of Seir the Horite. Now, what we see, we've already established, you can see in Scripture and in the book of Jasher, that Seir is not a physical descendant of Esau at all, but because of the intermingling of the seed that takes place, 
that they are put right within the genealogy of Esau. What we're going to see here is some big, big mistakes that Esau makes. He makes a big mistake by going into this mountain to begin with because this Mount Seir it's literally Nephilim Disneyland, and we're going to see that as we unpack the names of the inhabitants that lived on this mountain. It is absolute ground zero of Nephilim genetic corruption, and Esau thought he could go into this mountain and take it. You know, he sold his birthright for a bowl of, bowl of porridge, so he gave up what God had for him. He says, well, I can go take this. Well, it didn't work out for him, and it never works out for us when we go away from what God has planned for our lives. It always ends in disaster. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land of Lotan and Shobal and Zibion, and Anna and Dishon and Ezra and Dishan. These are the dukes of the Horites, the children of Seir in the land of Edom. And the children of Lotan were Horai and Heman, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. Now, I'm going to use a book that I use quite frequently. I find it um, extremely helpful. Um, it's called... Uh, Jones Dictionary of Old Testament Proper Names, and it's a old reliable book that uh, I like to go to. And what it does, it gives you the meaning of Hebrew names and of the names in the Old Testament. It gives you the meaning of them in uh, in Scripture in in Hebrew, what they really mean. Now we're going to go to the word seer. And we're going to look what that means in Hebrew. And uh, this is very interesting. It says, and this is 8165 in the Strongs, it's the same as Sair, Harry, Rough, a he goat, the satire. And literally, seer is the same word in the Hebrew that is satire only as a proper word name. This was the the actual uh, substance of this. And of course, we know from uh, the study of ancient mythology that these satires were half goat and half human. But the satire is something that's in the Word of God, and the Bible does not speak of the satire as some kind of a legendary creature. And these satires were actually worshipped as gods. We're going to show that in the scripture. They were worshipped as gods, and they were cohabitated with by humans. Now, in Isaiah 34, 14, it speaks of a scripture. We've read this in several presentations. It says, The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satire shall cry to his fellow, the screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. And the screech owl is translating the word Lilith, which we've talked about a lot also on previous Midnight Rides. So it talks about the wilderness being the place where these demonic uh, creatures live. And the satire is one of them. And these were worshipped by uh, the children of Israel, and it was all the way down here to the time of the dividing of the kingdom in uh, 2 Chronicles 11, 14 and 15. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem, for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. And he ordained him priest for every high place for the devils. Now look that word up in your strongs. And this is what I encourage people to do. Get a King James Bible, then get your strongs concordance. Look the words up for yourself. And if you do that with the word devil, you'll see this is the word satire. And they were worshiping these satires, and they were translated devils here in the King James Bible because they were worshiping these creatures. And we're going to be showing you more text where this worship actually involved 
intimus, intimate relations, and, and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And the worship of the calf, we're going to see that come uh, back also in a scripture in just a few moments, how that the worship of the calf was incorporated with the worship of these satires. And this also, uh, for those that are familiar, and I know that I'm, we have an extremely intelligent Midnight Ride audience, and I know all the time we're getting new, les new listeners also, and we're so very, very thankful for it. And the high icon of witchcraft and Satanism is the goat of Mendez. And if you look at this uh, occult symbol, also called the Baphomet, that it has both male and female genitalia. It is the androgynous god of Luciferianism. And in Mendez, Egypt, there was a temple where on the top of this temple, at a certain time, every day, temple priestesses would openly copulate with goats in front of the crowd that would draw to watch this every day. This is where this comes from, from the worship of these half-human, half-goat creatures. They worship them as gods. And in this text here, okay, and uh, John has is going to, at this point, he is going to speak to the existence in many cultures of these animal-human hybrids throughout the history. So go ahead, John, and speak to that for just a moment. Right on. So if anybody, if anybody's been paying attention to their history lessons, to their uh, classes of ancient studies at all, uh, most people don't study those things in school because it may not interest them, but. To us here, it's very interesting, but if you look at all mythologies and, and all ancient histories, which they call themselves histories, they don't call it mythology, uh, all the way dating back to Mesopotamian, to Egyptian, uh, you name it, they all have these hybrids. And, and David's talking about the satire. Uh, interesting, you know, you look at Pan uh, from mythology, Pan, and you look at the Pantheon, you look at all these different ideas surrounding this entity, it's pretty amazing. And oftentimes they have a flute, uh, which is another interesting aspect to it that we can talk about maybe at some point. And um, so in chapter 19 of the book of Enoch, and we're going to read this real quick. And it says, and Uriel said to me, here shall stand the angels who have connected themselves with women and their spirits, assuming many different forms, are defiling mankind and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as gods. Here shall they stand to the day of the great judgment in which they shall be judged till they are made an end of. And the women also of the angels who went astray shall become sirens. And I, Enoch, alone saw the visions, the end of all things, and no man shall see as I have. And so when you read this, you get this picture of these, these beings. These, it says, he says that he'll stand where there were the angels that connected themselves to women. And we, we all know what that is. For those of us that have read Genesis 6, and David will be pulling up Genesis 6 here a little bit later for those of you that don't know what we're talking about. But this is a, an event that took place in Genesis 6 where angels came down to Mount Hermon. Uh, 200 of them is what the scripture says. And they were tricked by Satans, five Satans, uh, maybe seven total. If you guys go to the show we did on the five Satans on the book, or Midnight Ride roughly a month or two ago, uh, you'll see that. But there's they tricked these, um, these watchers into defiling themselves with women. And they by doing so, they created these things called Nephilim, these giants. And not only did they... Um, defile themselves with women, but they defile themselves with beasts. But they also, according to the book of Enoch, had the ability to transform themselves into the likeness of beasts. Uh, and angels are different than humans, obviously. They have knowledge that we don't have. They also have um, this ability to be able to take on human form um, and do these things to women and possibly, uh, obviously, animals as well. And so when we look into uh, further into history here, um, we see this going all throughout. And, and I want to read one more, another scripture here is Isaiah 59, verse 5. 
And it says, they hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. And the word cockatrice here is also translated in the Septuagint as the uh, basilisk, which is an interesting creature. The picture that I have above this is actually from the movie uh, Harry Potter. There's a basilisk that is, is living in these tunnels, and it comes out. And uh, David, remember the show we did a while back about uh, the basilisk? Oh, and, yeah. And, the, and then in mythology, the only thing that can actually kill this creature is a mongoose, right? Is a, oh, a, yeah. mon uh, a weasel. A weasel. Okay, a weasel. A, yeah, weasel. Right, a weasel. And at the time we were doing this show, there was we were talking about CERN and we are talking about being a portal and we were talking about... Because in this movie, if you look at... It, I'm not telling you to go out and watch it, but there, it's like a portal this thing lives in. It lives in this thing. It can come out and it's in the bottom of this big uh, witchcraft school, right? The school of witchcraft, this Hogwarts. And uh, we were talking about CERN being this. And then so you, I think it was you or John or somebody found an article to where the um, the CERN got shut down because a weasel crawled up in yeah, CERN. Yeah, I guess Brother Hall, yeah. Yeah, Brother Hall. Interesting stuff, though. You're, what, uh, that show is actually uh, – we have that show in, in the description here if you guys want to go and watch some more on the Cockatrice or Basilisk. We, I got the link in here uh, with it. But, uh, David, talk a little bit to that uh, mythology, if you don't mind, and I'll get back into this in a second. Well, the – idea of the basilisk is that if it would look at you and you would look at it that you would die and this is connected and in the show we did on the basilisk we connected it with genetic corruption in the kingdom of Israel going all the way back to the time of the prophet Isaiah. There are definite links that we brought out in this broadcast that John mentioned to you about genetic corruption just in that text that we studied there. So it's really a fascinating study. And basilisk is in the word of God. And uh, the satires in the Word of God, and here in the Book of Enoch, it talks about the sirens. Well, we're the people that believe the Bible, you know, and when the Bible says that there were satires, we believe there were satires because we believe the Bible. And we have found that when you really believe the Word of God, that you're going to have some exciting things revealed to you because that's where the true revelations are. No doubt. And, and I love, you know, the interesting thing about it is we are, all of these things that we see as mythologies and all of these things we see as fiction uh, and they're brought forth in movies. There's a reality to these things. I mean, there's evidence that these things existed. There's um, there's whole world. Um, every every ancient account of the world, the beginning of the world, all has these stories. Every single one of them. Oh, yeah. And and the more we find out about history, the more we're finding out that the scripture is dead on when it comes to history, uh, such as this Exodus uh, show that was done on Netflix. Uh, I can't remember the name of the man. I've had him on the show before, but he did a show about uh, patterns of evidence and he did a couple shows and it shows that, you know, history had it actually had it wrong. Uh, what had it right is... Um, the scriptures and we, they find that through history when they, they recently found the city of, um, help me out here, David, the, the big ancient city that they thought didn't exist till recently. Um, a lot of people speculate that it might've been Babylon. Um, I'll have to think of the name here in a little bit, but, uh, we have these stories. So anyways, getting back to that idea behind it, uh, well, I, I'll try to remember that cause I, it's a real popular, somebody knows it, but, um, in ancient stories, you have these these hybrids. You have Hunaman, which was an Indian. Uh, he was in the Vedic texts as um, as a hybrid between. He was like a giant ape, a human, and this is where we get our King Kong mythology. If you look at the left hand side of this, that picture right there is actually one of the statues of Hunaman. He's often depicted depicted as being blue, uh, but he is basically the um, in charge of this forest dwelling. These forest dwelling apes that are out there. Uh, possibly an ancient ancestor of Sasquatch. I don't know, but interesting stuff. And then you have this uh, form of a satire that you find in ancient Mesopotamia where it has the body of like a bull and then a head of a man here. Uh, you find that there. You find in Egypt, you have all these bird creatures like Thoth and um, 
just a variety of alligator heads. I mean, you name it, they have all of these hybrids all throughout. Uh, you even have uh, this this picture here at the bottom is a, is a picture of some kind of hybrid that they're killing in an ancient. Uh, I can't remember. I should have wrote down where that was coming from, but it looks like a like a pig man. I think is what they called it. And then you have in um, Middle Eastern mythologies as well with this vase. It shows some of the Middle Eastern mythologies of the hybrids that they have. And you can go into very deep study about that. Like I said, we've done so many shows on some of these topics never quite like this through the book of jasher and never really quite tying in uh, this stuff to modern day uh, things but i think that it's very important to understand kind of where we're going and we'll talk more about that as well talk about how things always often repeat themselves uh, how they happen because we oftentimes look at things through uh, a different lens than what we should uh, oftentimes things we think are supernatural uh, maybe they are to us now because we don't have the technology that they had back then. Uh, but things that we thought supernatural were supernatural 30 years ago have come to pass. I mean, the idea that you can have a device that has a computer in it, you could take pictures, videos, call any bar in the world, uh, pass information off. This was considered supernatural um, 50 years ago, I would say. Yeah. 50 years ago, hundred, especially 100 years ago, people were 200 years ago, people riding on horses. Uh, we have things that are considered supernatural now. And so we need to be have our eyes open for this stuff. And David, I'll push it back to you here. All right. And um, we'll go to the text here in Deuteronomy 32 and 17. And it says, They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that knew that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Now, in the book of Jasher, we saw not just one animal-human hybrid, but several in that one text. And we see in Scripture how that these creatures were worshipped. And here in Deuteronomy, it says there were new ones coming up. I mean, there were so many of these that come up with a new animal-human hybrid. Well, let's worship that. And we, they, were, they were coming up like wildfire. And uh, it, it's amazing. And these things were worshipped as gods. And in our scripture, in uh, the book of Genesis, it referred to Seir the Horite. We saw this term in the book of Jasher, and we also see it in the book of Genesis. And Seir, as we have established, is satire. Now, Horite. Let's go to Jones' book of Bible names, and let's look what the word Horite means, and Horai, it means troglodyte. Yeah, you can't make that stuff up. Seer, the Horite, the satire, and you know, we're, we're talking about creatures here that are a real mixture. It's a mixture of all kinds of animal and all kinds of human DNA that are producing a variety of creatures. And there were so many, it was like a fad with uh, the children of Israel. A new one would come up, they would be enamored with it, they would worship that. And uh, this is exactly uh, the picture that we're seeing here from Scripture. Now, in the text here, in the book of Jasher, chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, the scripture says, And every man made unto himself a god. You see, it's whatever newly comes up. You worship this, I'll worship that, and uh, away we go. And, uh, and they robbed and plundered every man, his neighbor, as well as his relative. And they corrupted the earth, and the earth was filled with violence. And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands, according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days... Now listen to this. This is a little added info to the Genesis 6 scenario. In Genesis 6, we know that the fallen angels mated with human women, but this in the book of Jasher tells us that mankind got into the act 
big time. It says, The sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth, and it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon earth, all men and all animals. So we see that it's not just the corruption of the human genome, but the corruption of all animals that went forth and took place. Now, let's go to the book of Job. Now, these Horites or these Troglodytes or the cave dwellers are right in the word of God. And in the book of Job, which I have done teachings on, that I believe that the book of Job, the character and the main story is antediluvian. And it's possible that there were some uh, kind of finishing touches put on it after the flood. I don't know. But I believe that what we have described here in Job chapter 30 is an antediluvian context where we see these cave dwellers. And we see in this text, Job looks upon these creatures as subhuman, that like you'd run off a stray dog out of your yard. Let's just look at the text. It's fascinating. But now they that are stronger than I have me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. Yea, whereto might the strength of their hands profit me, in whom old age was perished? For want and famine they were solitary, fleeing into the wilderness in former time, desolate and waste, and always, over and over, the location of these creatures is spoken of as being in the wilderness, who cut up mallows by the bushes and juniper roots for their meat. They were driven forth from among men. They cried after them as after a thief to dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in the caves of the earth, and in the rocks. This subhuman culture of the, uh, the troglodytes driven away from men to live in caves. In verse 7 it says, On the, Among the bushes they brayed, under the nettles they were gathered together. They were children of fools, yea, children of base men. They were viler than the earth. And now am I their song, yea, I am their byword. And the scriptures abound with the testimonies of the existence of these creatures. Now, want to look at another meaning of one of these names of Lotan. And Lotan was the firstborn son. Now, Horai was the firstborn son of Lotan. And we'll look what the word Lotan means. And the word Lotan means covering up, to cover or to cover up, a son of Seir the Horite. Now, what I believe that means, and all you, we know here is from the name covering or covering up, but I believe that this speaks to the shame. And I believe that Lotan had enough human in him that he knew that there was something badly wrong and that he was ashamed of what he looked like. And uh, can you imagine when you've got uh, troglodyte-like creatures mating with satires, you know, and just an absolute conglomeration of genetic holocaust. So it's, uh, it's really sad uh, what this creature would have looked like. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, Chapter 2, we're going to look at the story of Esau, and a lot of people will want to say that Esau was a Nephilim. Esau was not a Nephilim. He was the son of Abraham and Sarah, the brother of Jacob, and um, 
he was a real bonehead, but he wasn't a Nephilim. And we're going to see that Esau was indeed a Nephilim fighter. And let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 2 and let's read the text. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them. For I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession." They that also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt there in old time, and the Ammonites call them the Zamzuman, or those that buzz. And in the Marian apparitions, this is something that the the children uh, at Medjugorje and others, they had testified to hearing a buzzing sound. Also, in the UFO phenomena of UFO abductions, many times there's this buzzing sound that is heard, and this is a real identifier as to the source of this phenomenon. But in verse 21, it says, A people great and many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them, before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead, as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horims from before them. And they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. So we see the same thing in the Word of God that we see in the book of Jasher. So Esau thought that he could go destroy these Horims, and he did destroy most of them, but what was the downfall was that not all of them were destroyed, and some of the seed of Esau actually cohabitated with these creatures to the extent that they are listed within the genealogy of Esau right in the word of God. So this is bonehead decision number two of Esau. And uh, we're going to see another big mistake that Esau made before we are done with our study for this evening. One, one thing weird, Dave, one thing not, not weird, one thing I've noticed too, like when it talks about the Anakims, uh, you have this, this uh, word, Anunnaki, you have these types of people, the ancient Hittites we're talking about. And, um, even in Scott, in, in, um, oh my goodness, Star Wars, Anakin is one of these yeah. beings that's got these special kind of, um, something within his blood, I guess the force, I guess you call it. They, I can't remember what they called that was in his blood. Uh, but he's not quite fully human. He's got this full, this, uh, he's like this chosen child. And, and when you go into Anunnaki, that's one of the biggest, I guess, uh, people think those were the gods, right? They're the ones that dwell on the star. I believe. Oh, yeah. What is the star called? That we we did a show about it one time. Uh, the everybody's talking about this star that's supposed to come to this planet, Planet X. Planet X, Nibiru. Plan, planet uh -huh. X, Nibiru. There's all this mythologies tied in together. But if you go to the Table of Nations, you actually find a lot of these. And I use the term people loosely. These people listed in these tables uh, is really interesting, man. I I know like um, if you look at some of these copper. Uh, I'm looking at them right now. These copper statues, seeing the size of these things in com comparison to humans, interesting. Anyway, I just want to call that out. Anakims; those are an interesting term and something you find throughout all um, mythologies, really. Yeah, and um, this is like John said: every culture on Earth has these stories. Every culture on earth preserves these creatures in their ancient drawings and their ancient statues. The Word of God talks about them as real creatures that actually existed. So that's why I don't have a bit of problem with what the book of Jasher is saying. Every bit of it is confirmed in the Word of God. And uh, we have, instead of having every reason to throw it in the trash and disbelieve it, we have every reason to believe it. Now, there's some other extremely compelling things from the book of Jasher that we're going to look at. And um, as it came out in the text in Deuteronomy 2, Esau 
hated the Nephilim, but because he had rejected God's plan for his life and tried to take uh, and go somewhere that uh, he wasn't supposed to go, big problems came upon not only him, but upon his descendants because of that. But let's read something else very fascinating in the book of Jasher, and I also believe this to be true. Jasher 27 and 7, And Nimrod and two of his men that were with him came to the place where they were when Esau started suddenly from his lurking place and drew his sword and hastened and ran to Nimrod and cut off his head. So we see in the book of Jasher that it states that Esau killed Nimrod. Now also, we're going to be going back to the scripture and we're going to be talking about this war that was a war between the Nephilim and we're going to show from Scripture, this war where I believe Esau did kill Nimrod. Now, another fascinating thing, and we've talked about this before. Uh, here's another boneheaded mistake that Esau made. And when Jasher 27 and 10, and when Esau saw the mighty men of Nimrod, Coming at a distance, he fled, and thereby escaped, and Esau took the valuable garments of Nimrod, which Nimrod's father had bequeathed to Nimrod, and with which Nimrod prevailed over the whole land, and he ran and concealed them in his house. Now, these are the ceremonial robes whereby Nimrod presided over his rituals. These came from his father, which in Scripture in Genesis 10 was identified as Cush. The ceremonial ritual robes of Nimrod, this is not what you want to have. No, uh, you don't want to dress up in those. And by taking these unto himself, Esau brought a curse upon himself, whereby everything he did when he went into Mount Seir, it went upon him as a curse, and the total pollution of, well, not total pollution, but the deep corruption of the bloodline of Esau. Now, there's a big lesson for us here, because we see the story in Scripture about Achan, and taking the cursed object. And there's still a reality to cursed objects. There's some things that you do not want to have in your home. In the Word of God, there are the elemental spirits called the Stochions. And what makes elemental spirits different? They are the spirits of earth, air, wind, and fire. And some of these stochion can attach to physical objects. So there are, sometimes you cast devils out, and sometimes you cast them off. And these stochion attach to ritual objects and ritual garments that are used in the worship of fallen powers, and they make them an accursed object. Now let's read the text in Joshua chapter 7 verse 20 and 21. And the scripture says here, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw amongst the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, fifty shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. And if Achan was cursed for taking the Babylonian garment, how much more was Esau cursed for taking Nimrod's personal ceremonial robes that he got from his father. It's a really interesting story, too. We did a show about it, and the link's also in the description on here. But if you trace that that garment 
according to Jasher, it's supposed to supposed to have gone from Adam to Enoch, or no, I'm sorry, to Methuselah. And Noah got it when he was on the ark. Then according to Jasher, it was stolen by um, Ham. And it would talks about when he uncovered his necklace, he stole it and he hid it and he gave it uh, his, he gave it to his son. And then his son gave it to Nimrod. And it says when he put it on, he became a mighty man. And basically all the animals submitted to him, all the humans submitted to him, every, uh, all of his brothers, everybody submitted to him and he became ruler over everything at the time. And at, at first it said he, he actually did what was right by God. Right. And then he turned, he kind of became a mighty man. Something happened. And I think that he, when he did have on that garment, he probably did. There's a lot of rituals that you see in witchcraft where they, they add uh, certain things to a physical object that causes it to curse people when they, yeah. when they die, all these different random things. But you see, you see this, uh, almost like a, this garment kind of going throughout the history. A lot of people have speculated uh, that e- either that garment or another garment like it was the one that uh, Joseph, the coat of many colors that was passed down. That's what made his brother so jealous because he was past this garment of power that was on and Elijah passed on his mantle, which is another word for garment to Elisha and just this interesting story, but you're talking about garments and how they hold things. The Catholic church, which I shouldn't have mentioned them, uh, mentioned or uh, they hold uh, relics from all over the world, uh, thorns that pierce the head, uh, the spear of destiny, um, and they've got it divided up between all these different churches. The the spikes, um, there's definitely a reality to that. Like like David said, if you hold on to interest, uh, you know, objects that have been cursed like that, you have to be very careful. I've talked to too, so many people that have they've had something in their house, and just getting rid of that object tended to tone down the the issues that they were having in, in that house and um, definitely important to pray over objects that you have because if you if you're planning on keeping them like me and David keep books we probably shouldn't keep in our house for research but we do pray over those things and and use them for research alone uh, but you have to be careful when taking in stuff sure and, and some of these ancient yeah. books I mean I've had people send me 200 year old books uh, before that I've had and um, there's definitely a heaviness to some of these things oh, before yeah. you pray over oh, yeah. them. So, yeah, and we do. We pray for uh, the breaking off of the stochion off of um, material that we use for research, and uh, because there's a real reality to it. And yeah. when you think of this concept, like John was talking about in Scripture, we have good godly garments, um, like Joseph's coat and Elijah's. Uh, mantle and we have the imitation of the ungodly garments we also did a show about moses's rod and uh, there's also the evil rod that is passed down which is still of uh, the rod the magician's rod and many things like that so everything that god does for the good satan corrupts this for the evil. I remember now why I brought this whole thing up. I got went in and talked in a circle, but we were talking about how the garment, how Esau stole the garment. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people theorize that when he took that garment and he went and sold his birthright, uh, part of that birthright he sold was that garment, getting rid of that garment of power and giving it to his brother instead of that, which is yeah. an interesting theory behind that as well. Really weird stuff. Dude. Yeah, it's fascinating. And you know, when, when we think about Nimrod being able to have power from a garment. Well, when you understand what the Bible says about the Stochion and the elemental spirits, there could have been devils directly attached to that garment that gave him power. That is a very uh, distinct possibility, and I do believe that that was indeed the case. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago, Sister and Donna and I got a call from a young family here in southern Indiana and in a nearby town, and they were having poltergeist activity in their home. And we went up and talked with this young couple, and there above their bed, they had African death masks and a whip, two whips that were together in an X and they weren't doing weird stuff with them. They just put them over their bed. But the fact that they brought these 
objects into their home that had been involved in serious occult rituals. This was causing poltergeist activity in their home. And when these objects, we, we prayed about it, we took them out, destroyed them, and it stopped. Uh, I could tell a lot of stories in this regard of things like this that have happened. And it's right in the Word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25 and 26, The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared there. In, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it. It is an accursed thing. So mm. we need to be very, very careful in this regard because there is a distinct spiritual reality to it. Now, John is now going to speak to us a little bit about things that are going on right now. These things that are spoken of in the book of Jasher uh, sound pretty far-fetched. You know, you're human from the waist down, animal from the, the waist up. Well, we're going to be looking at some things here that uh, John's going to share with us that, you know, not only are these animal-human hybrids from the book of Jasher coming back, they're here. Yeah, I mean, genetic manipulation has been going on for a long time. Most people know that as far as uh, animals, they're making them bigger, you know, bigger, uh, fatter, ready for consumption better. We know that. You know that they're genetic genetically manipulating plants we have monsanto that does a great job of that uh man manipulating plants and, and animals alike um you know to the point now to where you're we're we have to be cautious on what we consume at least we're supposed to be and we try our best of course we don't know everything that goes on with the animals unless we raise them ourselves. but we, right here in this picture you see a rat that has an ear, human ear growing on. This is a real picture of a rat with an ear. They take this human tissue. I skipped one slide, David. I'm going to go back to the other one. Okay. I just want to bring okay. this one up. They they put the ear on the hu on the tissue or they the ear from there and they use the human tissue from it to uh, help somebody that may be born without ears. So the same kind of thing they're doing with pigs right now with organs they because their organs i believe grow to full size within seven months on a pig so somebody could have a pig heart pig lung uh and it only takes seven months for that to happen to to be a good genetic uh, manipulation for that and on this other we have a bull here and these are these bulls that get massive um interestingly enough i just saw a video uh eddie hall i believe is the guy's name he's the world's strongest man uh guy he's not i don't think he's number one right now but he was at one time he um has this thing called uh, the Hercules gene is what he calls it. And that's what it's called. But there's this, uh, this thing that keeps their bodies from stopping growing muscle or from getting stronger. They get bigger, stronger, and stronger, and stronger. And it's like this inhibitor that keeps them from um, being, you know, stopping on this thing. And it's some, some people it can be fatal, but on humans like him, it's actually been a big uh, genetic um, positive for him. So we have the same, the same thing that is in him and Eddie Hall, this, this Hercules gene is the same thing that is in this cow that you see in this picture. And so that's pretty interesting. Now I'm going to go back to this video here. I'm going to play it here for you guys. And this just basically just talks about, uh, maybe if I can get back to it here. All right. We've got to get back to the right slide here. For some reason, David is not wanting to show the right slide here. Give me a second. Okay, here we go. Here we go. We got it. We're always having having issues with videos on these PowerPoints. On it, PowerPoint, get it together, man. It's always a problem, um, and it's not my fault. I'm not gonna say it's my fault this time. <laughs> I'm not gonna take the fault for it. Here we go. Scientists have created a human-pig hybrid. You never know what people strive to achieve. Some want to paint, others want to be president, and others want to create human-animal hybrid creatures. 
scientists at the Salk Institute injected a pig blastocyst with human cells. A blastocyst is that mass of cells that occurs after the fertilization of an egg, but before it is classified as an embryo. The blastocysts were placed back into pigs and the embryos removed three to four weeks later for analysis. A total of 186 were collected. This is the first I don't think the audio is playing for you guys for some reason, or the video itself is playing for you guys, but you get the idea. So they, they've actually created a human hype man, man pig hybrid. Um, and they're using it for genetic studies. Uh, Japan's just opened it up in 2019 for this to be legal to mix human and animals together. Uh, we all also have the CRISPR technology that people are using to upgrade their own DNA um, and possibly mix human and animal DNA with this stuff. And we were talking earlier about, uh, we, you, we see this stuff as supernatural, but the scripture you read earlier, uh, it talks about them teaching men to be able to do this. Uh, yeah. What was the scripture again, David? That was in the book of Jasher, chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. 4, 17 and 18. Can you read that one more time? Because I want to kind of get a full grasp on what we're talking about here. Yeah, and you see... This is fallen angel knowledge. Not only was there direct cohabitation of the fallen angels with human women, but this knowledge was taught to men, and they were very willing to get on the bandwagon. Jasher chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. And every man made unto himself a god, and they robbed and plundered every man his neighbor as well as his relative, and they corrupted the earth, and the earth was filled with violence. And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth and it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth, all men and all animals. And you see there, they did it, they did it, it said to um, entice the Lord to anger. Uh, they did that for that reason uh, specifically. And when you look at, you know, in the creation account, it says God created everything right it talks about it and he said then it was good so he called his creation good and so when people like us come along and decide to manipulate the things that he called good that's kind of like a slap in the face it'd be like going to an artist that just got done painting their mona lisa and then you say look you know it's pretty good but let me th put a mustache on that mona lisa uh people don't like that you know humans don't like that in general artists and imagine god who made uh made man in his image um, that image being manipulated and the animals that he created being manipulated, there is a real uh, problem that he sees with that. And this is why it ties into end times, because as we see a lot of times as a supernatural occurrence, uh, what it can actually be done through what we call science, falsely so-called, what we call as um, basically, in my opinion, fallen angel technology that is being passed on. And we did a show called Ancient Watchers. Uh, we did it on Midnight Ride a while back. The link is in the description. But it talks about these ancient technologies, how they go way back. We see things that we don't understand how they happen now. But as time goes on, we start to understand, okay, I can see technologies getting to a point to where this makes sense. And do I think it's technology compounded upon technology? Some of it is, but I think mostly, if you look at the time range to when most things happen, this great explosion of truth, there were a lot of weird incidents uh, that happened around the same time, uh, including including witchcraft workings by Crowley, uh, UFOs phenomenon in in the 1940s. Um, we have Germany uh, pushing for a hybrid program, a program of uh, these super soldiers that they supposedly found. We have so much, th so many things going on at the same time that lead me to believe that we had a knowledge explosion, but a lot of it was based on trying to channel entities. And when we look at the channeling of entities today, we see people um, such as uh, Oppenheimer, right? He, uh, when he created the nuclear weapon, which a nuclear weapon is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, it talks about this uh, 
fire coming down and it talks about blowing up in the shape of a mushroom cloud. It destroyed a whole race of people. They were salt before, you know, before they hit the ground. We see it in Sodom and Gomorrah. We see Oppenheimer quoting from the Bhagavad Gita also saying, I become death, the destroyer of worlds. He carried one of these, these books around. So, and you have artists that talk about, um, communicating with demons or demons as, as they call them. Uh, we have this going, this is a common thing throughout history and even new nowadays, people still, uh, even Tesla, for instance, he learned to tap into this entities that he could, you know, what Vedic text calls them, uh, the Mahat and the, um, the Prana. He tapped into that to get this, uh, information that we are, um, using today this technology and so i fully believe the technology we have is the technology that was around before the flood what we see as technology is actually uh the workings of the lowercase gods and that's exactly what we're seeing uh but we've been conditioned to accept it as um physical everything's physical everything you see is physical uh the the mental issues that people have are physical they're not demonic related uh the you know, the idea of us traveling to uh, certain planets and doing all these different things is all supposedly physical when indeed uh, they go back and they have ancient ties that are uh, supernatural. Um, and many people have stated, many scientists have stated there's not much difference between magic and science. And so we need to remember that and think through that. You know, we see these movies propping up and I'm going to be, I'll, I'll stop here in a second, Dave. I'm on a, on, a, go right ahead, John. on a quick little rant, but we see these movies like Marvel movies where you have these a god-like beings. Some of them are half gods. Some of them are full, and they're around helping save humanity from Earth, giving us a look at some of these creatures and beings as being malevolent, uh, some as being uh, benevolent. And so we have that, and we have in X Men we have these hybrid humans that are, you know, a little bit better than others, and you have these animal hybrids. And uh, I was looking at something. There's this video somebody put out, and you know, Marvel, and then right after that they put Marvel and they put not right after marvel not and they had the scripture that talks about marveling not after these things and so yeah it's interesting though we're we're being conditioned to accept that this is coming on as a reality uh which i believe it will be but we're being conditioned to think of it in a different light uh, rather than looking at it through the biblical light of what it actually is it actually an attempt to irritate god to put it lightly to irritate him uh to the point of judgment and destruction uh to curse his creation it says in genesis 6 or it says in i believe it's matthew as in the days of noah so shall it be when the coming of the son of man if we look at the days of noah all of this stuff that we're having going on right now is happening uh genetic manipulations happening and right now we're kind of being shielded from what they're capable of but uh there's many reports of all kinds of interesting beings all over labs all over the place being seen out in public um stuff that we as the consumer i guess the cattle aren't allowed to know about yet but when they're ready to unleash it you bet you'll know and um there will be a great deception that follows along with it if we don't aren't aware of what's going on in the scripture or what happened because we're doomed to repeat our past that's the way the biblical cycles always work in prophecy there's always uh, prophecies keep happening being fulfilled uh due to the nature of man and so um Interesting stuff. And, and David, go ahead. I'll, I'll pass it back to you. And it's not a coincidence in these slides that John has given on the return of these hybrids. We see here this cow that, you know, cows don't have muscles like that, do they? But here we see this genetic mutation. We have seen the rodent. We have seen the calf and we have seen the pig. Now, we have also already in a scripture tonight that in the book of Second Chronicles that the calf and the satire were worshipped together. And there's another scripture that connects the rodent and the swine. In Isaiah 66 and 17, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the garden behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. Now, I'm going to eat according 
through the way prescribed in Leviticus 11. Make fun of me if you will, but I'm going to eat according to Leviticus 11, and I'm going to pray for it before I eat that. We have got to be aware not only of the corruption of the human genome, but also of the corruption of the animal genome that is going on now, just as it was in the days of the book of Jasher and in the scripture in the book of Genesis. This is not coincidental. Now, we're going to go back to the book of Jasher and we're going to pick up another fact that we don't see in scripture. We're going to be taking this fact back to scripture and we're going to see something unfold with a lot of revelation and insight that I think is going to be pretty amazing. And in the book of Jasher, chapter 27 and verse 2, the scripture says, And Nimrod, king of Babel, the same was Amraphel. Now that's the little factoid we've learned here. Nimrod was Amraphel and also frequently went with his mighty men to hunt in the field and to walk about with his men in the cool of the day. Now what that's what is that a parody of? Yeah, that's Genesis 3 and 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Well, the garden's gone. It's now a field and Nimrod's there with his mighty men and the mighty men are the Gibberim, as John referred to earlier, and we're going to see uh, the way that that is used in Scripture here in Genesis 10.8, and Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one, a Gibberim in the earth. And as we've already said, Nimrod wasn't born a Gibberim, he came to be one, which is intimates in the text genetic manipulation that he no doubt willingly submitted to to become the mighty one when he took the ceremonial clothes of his father. Now, Genesis 10 and 8 is the second mention of Gibberim, mighty men in scripture. We'll read to you the first one, which is here in Genesis 6 and 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And in Genesis chapter 11, verses 6 through 9, we know the story. This is the scattering. At the Tower of Babel, they were scattered in Genesis 11. We'll read the text. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and this doesn't just refer to the building of this tower to go through portals into the, the second and third heaven and in the spiritual realms, but it had to do with this genetic corruption, and men, as we saw in the book of Jasher, they were doing this genetic corruption. And God is here putting a stop to it, as he will in the very near future do again. The people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Let us go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. Now, what we're going to see when we take the fact we learn from the book of Jasher that Jasher, or excuse me, Nimrod is Amraphel, that 
when the father scattered Nimrod and all of these people that Nimrod did not fold his tent and leave town. But what God scattered, he quickly went to work to regather, and this resulted in a Nephilim war. And let's go to the book of Enoch. Now, we're going to see in Scripture, after the flood, what took place in the book of Enoch in the antediluvian period before the flood of Noah. In Enoch 10 and 9, it says, And to and to Gabriel said the Lord, Proceed against the bastards and the reprobates and against the children of fornication and destroy the children of fornication and the children of the watchers from amongst men and cause them to go forth, send them one against the other that they may destroy each other in battle for length of days shall they not have. And this took place in the antediluvian world. It was a judgment from God. We see in the book of Enoch that these Nephilim tribes fought against one another and destroyed one another. Well, the same thing took place after the flood. We see a Nephilim war recorded right in the Word of God. And when we understand that Amraphel is Nimrod, we can get some real interesting insight into what's going on. Let's read the text in Genesis chapter 14. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel. Well, that's Nimrod. Amraphel, king of Shinar, that's Nimrod. Arioch, king of Elisar, Shedloramar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemember, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bala, which is Zor. All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. And what we have here, we have four kings. Nimrod, Shedlaramur, and these other two. And we have these five kings led by Sodom and Gomorrah. They break off from the, the rule of Shedlaramur. And here we see something interesting. It says 12 years they served shed Lorammer, and in the 13th year they rebelled. You see, Nimrod isn't the big duck in the pond anymore, but now shed Lorammer was the head of this four king alliance of which Nimrod was a part. So you see, Nimrod got knocked down a little bit. He's still a player, but shed Lorammer is the leader of these four kings of which Nimrod has a part. You see, God scattered it. And they, with these four kings, were trying to regather what God has scattered. So here we have the, the king of Sodom and Gomorrah break off. Well, what do they do? They declare war on them. And we see happening after the flood what the book of Enoch said happened before that these Nephilim tribes went to war one with another. Now, it says... In the text in Genesis, and in the fourteenth year came Shedlaramur and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims in Ashtoreth Karnaim. Now, if you look up the word in your Strong's Ashtoreth Karnaim, this is the Ashtoreth of the two horns, like the two horns on a bull, like the two little horns on the Viking helmet. And if we would study in Isaiah 14, 12, Lucifer, son of the morning, Hallel ben Shakar, that this was a designation for what men call the planet Venus. And if you would trace the movement of Venus it would actually make the shape 
of bullhorns, as it is sometimes a morning star and sometimes an evening star. So we see here that these Rephaim, these giants, they were goddess worshipers. And the Zuzims and Ham, the Emons and Sheveth, Kiriathim, and the Horites, you see, there's our friend the Horites. They were right in the middle of this. The Horites in Mount Seir. And Nimrod came to destroy these troglodytes in Mount Seir, and I believe that's when Esau killed him in this war, when we read of that in the book of Jasser. So you see here we have Nimrod and these other three kings coming into the area of Sodom and Gomorrah and attacking these giants. Now, in the Nag Hammadi scriptures, and I'm not going to read them, but we've talked about these before, but it talks about the second incursion, and I, I think I will. I think I'll take time to read one of them, because in these Nagamati codices, and every time I read the Nagamati scriptures, I want to emphasize that these are not in any way godly scriptures that I recommend. These are the scriptures of those that reject the true ways of the Father. Now, I want to read quickly from this because according to the Gnostics, Sodom and Gomorrah was the seat of the second incursion of Nephilim after the flood. So it's very interesting when we see Nimrod the Gibberim attacking the Nephilim that are in the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. But this is what this Gnostic text says. It says, Great Seth, son of the incorruptible human Adams, the great invisible virgin spirit. Seth asked for his seed, bearing fruit from the wellspring of Sodom and Gomorrah, fruit of the wellspring of Gomorrah within her. And in this Gnostic text, Seth, who is not the Seth of the Bible, has relations with this so-called virgin spirit, and there's a new incursion brought forth here in, in Sodom according to this text. Now, I want to read a scripture in Isaiah, and this is another entity we've talked about. We did the show on the five Satans not long ago, and we identified Two, we identified five Satans from the book of Enoch, we, or rather Seraphim. We identified two from Scripture, the Assyrian and Satan. Now, in Isaiah 23, 13, Behold the land of the Chaldeans. This people was not till the Assyrian founded it. The Assyrian that we read about in Ezekiel 31 he founded the land of the Chaldeans and the land of Shinar. Now, this is uh, Flavius Josephus, which is another historical work that we refer to regularly. And I want to read the account from Flavius Josephus of this war that we see in the book of Genesis, and it's interesting that he calls this four-king alliance with Nimrod and Shedlaramur the Assyrians, and he speaks of the area of Sodom and Gomorrah of having these giants. It's fascinating. He says this. This is on page 33 of the Whitson edition. The Assyrians made war upon them, and dividing their army into four parts fought against them. But on the thirteenth year they rebelled, and then the army of the Assyrians came upon them under their commanders Amraphel, Arioch, Shedlaramur, and Tidal. These kings had laid waste all Syria and overthrown the offspring of the giants, and when they were come over against Sodom, they pitched their camp in the vale called the slime pits. You see, and Nimrod 
didn't want to destroy the Nephilim and the Rephaim because he was a good guy, but it was about regathering what God had scattered. He was the big guy at the Tower of Babel. Now Sodom and Gomorrah, they were breaking off. He wanted to regather this Nephilim rule that he had lost at the judgment at the Tower of Babel. A couple more texts that associate uh, the second incursion in, uh, of the Nephilim after the flood here with Sodom and Gomorrah. In the book of Jubilees, chapter 20, we will read here in verses 5 and 6. And he told them of the judgment of the giants and the judgment of the Sodomites, how they had been judged on account of their wickedness and had died on account of their fornication and uncleanness and mutual corruption through fornication. And guard yourselves from all fornication and uncleanness and from all pollution of sin, lest ye make our name a curse and your whole life a hissing. And all your sons be destroyed by the sword and ye become a curse like Sodom and all your remnant as the sons of Gomorrah. And one more text from the book of Ecclesiasticus, which was originally in the King James Apocrypha. And a lot of people ask, whenever I read, I use this Bible here of the New Cambridge Paragraph Bible when I read from the King James Apocrypha, because it's just like everything else. The apocryphal text that we find in uh, other translations differ greatly in, a, in not a good way. But let's read the uh, scripture in Ecclesiasticus uh, chapter 16, and let's look at verse 7 and 8. And again, this association with the Rephaim and Sodom, it comes out again. He was not pacified toward the old giants, who fell away in the strength of their foolishness. Neither spared he the place where Lot sojourned, but abhorred them for their pride. He pitied not the people of perdition who were taken away in their sins. So this association is out there, and I believe that it's a valid one. And from this first war, we see the judgment of God against these entities that were corrupting the human and the animal genome. Just like Babel, this war and subsequent judgments and God raising up King David to be the, the, the Nephilim fighter in Joshua, that uh, these things were suppressed to some degree. Now today, we are living in the days and the time when we are literally seeing the return of these animal-human hybrids that we see here in the book of Jasher. And from the pattern that we have seen, we know that the judgment of God is drawing near once again. Bravo, my right good friend, David Carrico. Very good job uh, on presenting this. I mean, it just mind-blowing stuff, man. You're, you know, I say this all the time and people think uh, you're just saying it because you're friends with David, but David's one of the best researchers I've ever met in my life and I've talked to a lot of them. And it just so happens that we live very close to each other and I'm very thankful that we do. You know, uh, God really um, knew what he was doing, putting us together like this. I'm so thankful to, for the opportunity to be able to help share David's content and be able to get out here and do this stuff. Him and his wife, Donna, are a huge blessing. Um, we're getting ready to go to questions and answers. So if you don't want to see questions and answers, go to one of the links we provided in the description to one of the other shows we're talking about. If you do, stick around for it. And if you are here and you liked this program that you saw right now, on the count of three, we're going to do something we do every show. And it's called the Pounder Smash. You're going to smash that like button like crazy. Just smash it real hard, okay? Or dislike if you didn't like it. On the count of three. One, two, three. Boom. Smash. And uh, we appreciate that. Also, share out this video. Um, you know, we we don't often get on the related videos uh, tab on YouTube. Sometimes we do. But share it out for the world to see so we can, you know, let people know what the agenda is. The agenda is coming they're pushing it down people's throat, and most people have no idea that this stuff is in ancient scriptures 
that are true holy scriptures and we need to let them know that is happening hit the subscribe button if this is your first time listening thank you so much for listening hit the subscribe button and we are going to welcome from the cutting edge broadcast that goes on every single morning except for saturdays and sundays mr john hall what's up buddy our i get to say it now live 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 on the midnight ride am i late with it you're late it's never too late for that <laughs> uh, okay hey guys we're got... still live 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 <laughs> oh my goodness so i'm in the chat room on both the uh live tr chat on the now tv live stream that's nystv.org and on youtube you guys got a bunch of great questions along this topic i can't wait to get into this we well, can't let's, either let's let her roll Okay, the first one is, Mr. Pounders, how long have you looked like Mark Wahlberg? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I've been told that so many, especially when I have my hair like this, people always think there's this movie where Mark Wahlberg had a beard in it. And I don't know what it is, but there's like been at least 10 people in my lifetime that have said that. And I can't even picture uh, what Mark Wahlberg looks like exactly. Um, I know he's in several movies, but... I've heard people say it before. I don't know. It's just, it's, I guess it's a good thing. It's better than looking like uh, that dude from the Goonies, right? Or the guy with the big uh, caved in head. It's so. the Goonies. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, I don't want to sound like a CNN broadcaster uh, in a debate with Mr. Obama and somebody else in the Democratic Party, no pun intended. Uh, that was, a, that was a, a snowball kind of a question. Here comes a really good one for both of you. Are you ready? We're ready, sir. Michael Bryan says, what are the main discrepancies between Jasher and the accepted canon? Well, as I said at the beginning, I do not hold the book of Jasher in as high regard as I do the book of Enoch. There are problems establishing the authority of the text, like in the Gospel of Matthew, we have over 5,000 Byzantine texts that we can look at. It's well-preserved, well-established. It's not the case with the book of Jasher. So we can't approach it as scripture or even on a par with the book of Enoch. But we can look at it in the light of being a book that has some very ancient traditions that can be verified in other ancient sources that just like tonight these uh these things that intertwine so much with the word of god i really find them edifying fascinating and well worth the time for us to look at so if we use this book correctly i believe that it can be a great blessing amen thank you for that uh the next question goes right along with that one what is a good book of Jasher? Where can one find a good copy? Well, the one that I have and that I use, it's uh, Bible Facts Annotated Edition. And uh, that's the one that I use. I believe this is the one that was put out by Ken Johnson. And uh, when I use the book of Jasher, that is the one that I use. Excellent. Uh, Taylor asked, uh, do you do you think the hybrids have souls? Well, John showed the picture uh, and what was talking about the pig that has human genes inserted into it. Maybe not the picture was talking about it, but I have read accounts of people that have looked these pigs in the eye and got totally freaked out because they would have consciousness. You could tell that they were looking with intelligence and awareness. Now, what I believe is going on is that these pigs are possessed by devils and that just like in we read in Scripture that... Uh, these disembodied spirits can go into humans and also they can go into animals. And I think that uh, in the scripture, in the incarnation of Christ, in the book of Hebrews, it says a body that thou hast prepared me. And I believe that through this genetic corruption, Satan is preparing 
bodies for these disembodied spirits to inhabit. And I believe literally that these animals are devil-possessed. Amen. Uh, Julie is asking this question. Is it true they crucified Yeshua on a tree? And did Noah take two animals, male and female, two clean or seven of each unclean? Anyone here know, please, now you see the Please put this to uh, Nice TV's questions. The reason why I'm asking this is it's going back to Noah, and it just prompted this question. And do you have it? Could you help this individual out? Uh, was he crucified on a tree? And uh, did I guess does it correlate with Noah taking two uh, clean and or was it seven? Was it seven clean and two unclean? Right. Yeah. And uh, the scripture speaks of Jesus dying upon a cross that was made out of a wood. And this is referred to in Scripture uh, in Deuteronomy. It says, Cursed is everyone that hangs upon a tree. And therefore it's referred to as a tree because the Scripture was seen fulfilled there of Christ's death upon a cross. So to be technical, we would say that it was a cross made from a tree, uh, seen as the fulfillment of the scripture in Torah. And yes, as John just said, that there were seven of the clean animals taken on the ark, is according to scripture. Thank you. Uh, this one comes up. Are you thinking that Job was prior to the flood? And if you do, what makes you think that? Well, on FOJC radio, um, and this was probably back and i we did some also on now you see tv on antediluvian job and i did several teachings on this taking all of the antediluvian uh elements uh in the book of job such as some of the things that we've seen tonight of uh, the horites and many things and i believe job did live antediluvian and like the book of enoch I believe that it came over on the ark. Now, it's possible that Noah or some of the others uh, added parts to it after that. But I have believed for some time that Job did live antediluvian. And I've done several teachings on FOJC and even some on Now You See TV in this regard. Antediluvian Job on FOJC radio Uh is what you would look for. And if you have trouble finding it, I'm sure if you email Sister Donna, she can help you with those program numbers. That is FOJC.com, guys. Next question comes from Kathy Welsh out of YouTube. Uh, this one's a really good question. What happened to Enoch's children? Why weren't more on the ark? We don't know. Uh, we just don't know. Well, scripture you... silent about it and we you know we we don't know so it's uh, uh not good to speculate uh mr dan bedoni asked a question about jasher uh, dan who uh mr dan bedoni i'm dan, using his full name dan bedoni oh I'm i know him. that guy i know that uh -huh. guy <laughs> what's he up is dan asking... bedoni he is asking about uh, where it speaks in the book of Jasher about the animals gathering around the ark. Uh, is that a true, is that part of the story? And were they protecting, were they protecting the ark in the book of Jasher? I am not real familiar with the text that he's referring to. I've read it before. And um I, you know, I would say that I think that uh, this is indeed quite possible because we know that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, according to Scripture, and there wasn't a whole lot of people going for what Noah had to say. And I, uh, we don't know, but I think it's common sense that would tell you that a lot of people would have liked to have stopped Noah and that which he was doing. So I would have to say I think that's possible. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, this comes from uh, a YouTuber, Tailed. It says, the Anarchy, were they related to the Nephilim? Are they related to them? Yeah. The, uh, the Anunnaki is a play on the word Anakim, which is in Scripture, 
and this was basically a Sumerian word. What was called anakim in the scripture from the he- translation of the Hebrew word in the Sumerian, the transliteration would be Anunnaki. And uh, there's, like John was talking about this uh, character in Star Wars, Anakim, is that right, John? Yes, a- Anakin. Anakin. Yep. And you see all kinds of these similarities in other um, ancient cultures and also in modern pop culture because of this Genesis 6 scenario has a huge footprint. Well, I've got to say it. Uh, yeah, it was Anakin Skywalker, and he was full of metachlorians, John. Metachlorians. That was, oh, a, that was the word I was looking for, metachlorians. Yeah, that was the word you were looking for. And yeah. I got the little hint, uh, David living so close to you. I got that hint. I got it. Oh, you <laughs> mean, yeah. Well, I've been, for those of you who don't know, I've been trying to talk John into moving closer so he can do this shows from the studio. So hit the like button if you want that to happen. If you haven't hit Why it Why hasn't that happened yet as a matter Well, what's going on over there, John? What's going on? I, we're know. taking we're taking things one at a time. <laughs> uh, one at a time. Hey, uh, my daughter just went on a date tonight. So it's oh, my first man. time around on that one. So yeah, yeah, like now every now all of you know that. So as a, a, a wreck. But anyways, let's get back into this. Uh, Dolus asked, who is Isu and what what does his bloodline have to do with prophecy? Esau. Esau, yeah. Yeah. Esau, as we see in the text today, was, uh, and of course he was the brother of Jacob. Jacob has the bloodline of the Messiah, and through Esau, there is the corrupted bloodline. And we see from the what we've studied this evening how that when Esau wrongly went into Mount Seir, that his bloodline became polluted with uh, the Seirites and the Horites. And we've done also, uh, John would... Uh, could help me with the titles of the Illuminati bloodlines. There's, uh, and I think this show is probably, uh, has more hits than any other, uh, if you would search on the most popular on uh, Now You See TV, this is number one, I think, about a half a million views. And we talked there about the bloodlines. And we talked about how that these are traced through the bloodline of Esau. And we brought out a lot of things, how that the Edomites were, uh, how the Herodians were Edomites. And this is a huge study. But basically, the line of Esau throughout time was the competing bloodline to this day with the bloodline of the Messiah that came through Jacob. And the show is called The Ten Bloodlines of the Satanic Kings, Bible Prophecy and History. And it's uh, the one that's got nearly half a million views on it. We streamed it about a year ago. So, that's yeah. A, so, yeah. Um, and that was, I mean, we have just, uh, that's a good show. It's got a ton of information. And uh, that will help you understand the role that the line of Esau plays in Bible prophecy. Excellent. So we've got a, a, a question on Mothman. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Always ready for Mothman question. Okay. This comes from Modern Maniac. Uh, they say, I have heard mention on several shows about Mothman in the United States in recent years. Can you elaborate on Mothman, where and when this happened, and what went on? Well, we've got a show on Mothman. <laughs> <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it crazy you can we say that? we got a show on it. Uh, about every show, every topic you bring up, I believe, because we have over a thousand shows on YouTube. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure we've covered most topics at least once, Mothman definitely being one of them. Yeah, and uh, you can search that on uh, NYS TV. And Mothman took place at uh, – Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And we are right on the Ohio River, and John Hall is too. John's up in uh, near the Louisville area on the Ohio River. We're here 
uh, near Evansville on the Ohio River. You keep following it out. You go to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and this whole river valley has been uh, historically associated with giants, UFO phenomenon, and all of these type of things. And I believe, and uh, we've talked about this many times, that I believe that Mothman is one of these uh, animal human corruptions that is of the the seed of the Rephaim. And in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19, uh, thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they, ar- they arise, awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Now, in this one scripture, there are three different Hebrew words that are translated dead. The final one is the word Rephaim, and it speaks of the earth in the last days casting out these Rephaim. If you look at the Septuagint of translation of Isaiah 13, it talks about the gates opening and the giants coming forth. And I believe that Mothman is an example of one of these Rephaim being cast from the earth. In uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia, there was an old dynamite factory that had all kinds of huge underground caverns and caves. There were natural caves there, as well as man-made tunnels. And I believe that in the case with this, or whether you talk about the... uh, uh, the foggy, uh, foggy mountain bottom monster down in um, Arkansas. That all of these creatures seem to be associated with these deep underground caverns. So Sasquatch and all of these, I believe that this is an end time manifestation of the Earth casting out these Rephaim and uh, all of these crypto creatures. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of it. And these things are reaching epidemic proportion of the sightings of these type of animals. There were over 600 sightings in 2019 in Washington State alone. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh, it is. Well, here comes another, and these questions are right along the same lines. I think you mentioned something about this a week or so ago, John. Uh, Brian asked, Esau was a, a Nephilim fighter that was in a question mark. So they're asking if he, uh, asking you guys if, if he was a Nephilim fighter. He goes on to say, is that where Jack and the Giant Killer, I guess it was prequel to Jack and the Beanstalk, comes from? And I think you mentioned something about Jack and the Giants a week or so ago, John. Uh, it was a while ago, but um, the old nursery rhyme, B5 Fo Fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. It talks about the, uh, it's talking about these giants that had a taste for human flesh, which would go along with Enoch and, and all the different things. Now, I, I don't know if it's specifically exactly what you were talking about, but Enoch is an interesting character because, or not Enoch, but uh, Esau is an interesting character for sure. Like David said, I don't think he is Nephilim, but I think that it's very obvious that he was a warrior. He was stalking. He was a mighty hunter as well. In, uh, Esau was just like the only other person you call see a mighty hunter in the scripture is uh, Nimrod. And it says he was stalking him. Basically, he was stalking him and came out and lopped his head off. Um, and, and, in, and in the Genesis 14, it gives a... Uh, interesting side note to what's been was going on during the time that all this was happening so anyways um i don't know if that's what you're talking about but that's uh what i got i have said so many things in the last few weeks i don't i don't even (laughs) (laughs) can't keep track so anyways uh let's see here brian and we're going to stick with brian because he had two questions and i just split them up because this one is a little different so what are your thoughts on joseph um a coat of many colors how does this play into this do you think it was handed down do you think it uh, is some kind of I don't, I don't know was it passed on from the ark do you think what is it again, John? Say it one more uh, time. Joseph's uh, color, uh, his coat of many colors. You know, it's speculation no matter what you say because, uh, you know, we have this cryptic coat that's being passed down from generation to generation. We have um, 
you know, we have what appears to be a cloak that people are passing on now through popes, and, and it looks like Dagon, like the Dagon worship type. I think there, like David was saying, I think there's an imposter of the of the real cloak of power, an evil one, and then there's a good one possibly, or they're both the same. I don't know exactly. I mean, there's really no way to know that unless you have that cloak um, and you've been told the story about it being passed down. But I think it's a uh, interesting representation of uh, the authority that's been passed down from generation to generation, no doubt. Um, it's all speculation. I mean, don't you agree, David? It's speculation. Oh, yeah. There's oh, no yeah. way to it's, know it's for sure. It's interesting to think about, but we, we can't know for sure. And um, like I said, we have to be slow, uh, and not just slow, but totally slow, in taking things and making doctrines out of them. But they are interesting, and when we put these things together with Scripture, we can discern uh, truth from error in them. And uh, also the Scripture we read this evening about Esau coming into Mount Seir and destroying these Horite uh, troglodyte Nephilim creatures is Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 22. And then we did a show before, David, talking, I think, more about the troglodyte type creatures, and, and we kind of equated them, if I remember, to the little Nephilim, the little yeah, the yeah. little people, mm -hmm. and, and like you see in or reading novels like The Lord of the Rings, etc., and, and uh, movies, you see these beings that live in the earth. They, they call them dwarfs, I believe. Yeah. And they're the ones that kind of protect the gold. They sit and hoard gold. And, yeah, um, and, yeah interesting. Yeah, I and in the was... uh, book of Ezekiel, it talks about That's the right. Gamadims. And it, in the Bishop's Bible, which is a pre-King James Textus Receptus Bible, it translates the Gamadim as pygmy. And the word Gamadine, uh, there's never been in history known a country of the Gamadines or a people of the Gamadines. And what the Hebrew word there means is cubit. And for, for that reason, the translators of the Bishop's Bible believe that this was talking about a little bitty guy. And I think they're right. And it speaks of these Gamadines being in the towers that are fighting. And this is what we see in Scripture. We see this in the accounts of pagan cultures that not only were the giants huge, but they were also little guys. And we see the whole um, traditions of the dwarfs, the fairies, the elves, and, and all of that too. And what we're talking about is genetic corruption of humans that went in all kinds of different directions and also of the animal genome that went in all kinds of different directions. And and uh, you know, this is kind of different. Somebody asked in the chat, and I just happened to check it out. It was talking about the emerald tablets and what we know about that. And, and I just want to say that a lot of people connect Thoth, that is supposedly the writer of this, to Hermes. And some people connect Hermes to being the evil Enoch, which we did a show uh, you actually just recently on the Book of Enoch, uh, um, we're going to be doing a show this coming Thursday, hopefully, or next Thursday, on the evil Enoch and his, um, or did we already do that one? No, we haven't Okay, done We're okay. ready to roll with that. Yes, next that's Enoch right. we do will be the revelation of Enoch the evil. Yes, and so I believe that this is connected to him. He was a city builder. He was also into um, transmutation, alchemy. Um and this is where you get a lot of this stuff, in my opinion. And they, they found these tablets. They found a bunch of different stuff in these vaults. There's nine vaults that they found. And a lot of people believe there were a lot of the secrets uh, that were passed down from the fallen ones. David, you got any more insight into emerald tablets? Yeah, and the emerald tablets are, um, there are probably two or three different versions of the story uh, in different traditions that speak to the recovering of antediluvian knowledge after the flood by the finding of tablets or pillars that were inscribed with knowledge. So uh, I believe, and I know John would agree, that in the antediluvian world, there were scientific knowledge that was in some time, obviously greater in some areas than we possess today because we cannot even duplicate some of the things that we know that took place in the antediluvian world.
All right. Thank you, guys. And, and John, thank you for catching that in the chat room. I saw that, and uh, it's a good catch on there. Uh, this one, this one's a good question, guys. This is for both of you. This comes from Michael. Uh, don't you find it curious that it says God hated Esau, yet Jacob cheated him out of the blessing? How does that work? Yeah, and in the, the text in Malachi, when it speaks to that, it is speaking to the generations. And in the lifetime, you can go back and read the account uh, when um, Jacob is going to face Esau again, and he's scared to death. And Jacob calls Esau Lord <laughs> several times in that passage because Esau, I mean, he killed Nimrod. He was a bad guy, you know. And uh, Jacob had lied to him, and he was all scared. So this all comes in the book of Genesis up to uh, chapter 28 when Jacob wrestles with the angel and is transformed. But, uh, yeah, I believe that um, most definitely uh, Esau was a little stinker. But, you see, I do not agree with our Calvinist friends that believe that some people— are predestined unto heaven and some are predestined unto hell. And in this passage in Malachi, it's speaking to the descendants because Jacob did not rule over Esau. But in the descendants, after the bloodlines played out, this became the case. Thank you so much for that. Uh, this question comes from uh, the YouTube uh, Tailed Fairies. And what do these scientists hope to achieve by mixing human and animal DNA? So what is their end goal? Transhumanism. I believe they are driven by the same fallen angels that were driving that which we see in the book of Jasher, the book of Jubilees, the book of Enoch, and in our the canon of Scripture. And it is nothing less than the quest for immortality and eternal life without Jesus Christ, that they can actually do this. And it's about uh, becoming superhuman. And this is all over our society. You, you don't like the way you look? Well, change the way you look through plastic surgery, uh, genetic enhancement, and all of these things. And we are literally seeing the return, not only of the animal-human hybrids in the book of Jasher, but the whole Nephilim gospel that was preached in antediluvian days. It's coming back full bore. And and like the scripture you quoted or earlier, the text you quoted, the ancient text of Jasher, uh, they, they did it to make God mad. Yeah. To, to, to irritate him. And yeah. I think that a lot of, a lot of stuff that goes on in our country, um, is a, is the demons and de and devils wanting God to be mad at us so that we, that he can destroy us because, um, I mean, Satan hates, hates, uh, basically here's the way I look at it. You know, Satan is going down and misery loves company. Anything he can do to bring more people down with him. If somebody's fallen into a, tar pit and they can grab onto somebody and pull them down with them maybe you know save their own skin in the process i feel like that's what i see these entities doing they know their time is short um which is pretty this, scary to think about i this, guess this next question goes to along to what you guys are talking about right now uh this comes from djm photos uh, they've been finding bones all over the earth. So is this cover up to deceive people about the true history and collection of DNA for hybrids, or is there more to this? Well, we did a show um, with you and Patty about um, the Kentucky Nephilims and the mounds, and I think it was primarily with Patty, and I think you came in at the end, if I remember right. Yes, and, sir. And Patty brought forth that night a documentation from the University of Kentucky how that giant bones have been found in every county in Kentucky. And this entire area that we live in is saturated. We also talked about uh, the city of Lexington 
uh, how that the city of Lexington has vast underground uh, tunnels in it with red-haired giants in it that have been found and that the actual history of Lexington has been suppressed, as is the, the history of many. So, yeah, and you see, the theory of what the Bible says about these giants and everything, that doesn't go along with their theory of evolution and uh, the things that they want us to believe. So what does not fit in with that, what they want us to believe, these things are suppressed. And um, the efforts that they did, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of articles of... Um, Nephilim and giant bones that have been found in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana, right in this very uh, Ohio River Valley with uh, in which we now live and from which we are now speaking. The same is true all over the earth. Amen. Amen. Yeah, they are all over the place. There's two or three of them here in Nelson County. I know it's uh, 1 a.m. here. I know it's midnight there. I've got one question left for you guys. It's a really good one. And uh, are you ready? We're ready. Okay. This one comes from uh, Gigi. She asks, is being pure in this generation, as Noah was called, the same as being born again? To be born again, uh, in Titus 3.5, it speaks of the washing of, of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, literally a regening. And when we are born again, we become a new creature, a new creation, quite literally, in Christ Jesus, a change that is so profound, it affects our basic uh, genetics. And it's also been proven from scientific studies in the study of epigenetics that the same is true for people that do ungodly things and live lives of habitual sin, that it actually changes their genetics. So yeah, the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, that he was pure in his generations, that he had that uncorrupted uh, bloodline, which is why he was chosen uh, to be the the start of that pure bloodline from which Messiah would come through. So absolutely, we have that tremendous uh, promise of the gospel that whatever, uh, and you know, we don't know what's in our family line. We've all, uh, if we want to look very close, we got some bad stuff in our family lines. But through Christ, we have forgiveness, we have grace, we have cleansing, and the one sure, the only place of safety we have is by believing the gospel that Jesus Christ died upon the cross for us as payment for our sin debt. We can place our faith in that. We can do as Christ commanded to repent and believe the gospel. New birth cleansing. It's all ours in Christ. It doesn't get any better than that. All right, guys, uh, there's two or three more questions. If you want to keep going, we can, but uh, uh, it's up to you guys. I think we're going to chop it off All right. at, at midnight. It's a little after midnight. Don't forget to fall back with your time. Right now, for us, we're falling back right around midnight, so it's actually an hour, 11 o'clock now, David. So you ready to do another hour? Wow, no, probably not. Yeah, no, I, I'm kidding. <laughs> But it is, it is fallback time. From what I understand, if I'm wrong, forgive me. But that's what I've been hearing all day long. Uh, hopefully, um, it's the truth, and uh, I think it is. So make sure to set your clocks back. And, um, man, I, you know, once again, a blessing to do the show. Thank you guys all so much for listening. Thank you, David, for presenting such an amazing show, uh, something for people to study and research. This is the stuff you don't hear about in church. So you hear about it on Now You See TV. Uh, they kicked us out of the church. So now we uh, YouTube let us in to talk on there for a little while. And we had our own <laughs> website and social media. So thankful for that because, I mean, if church talked about these subjects, I bet you there would be a lot more people that uh, were into the scriptures um, 
today. And it's unfortunate they don't, isn't it, David? It's unfortunate, it John. Is. I mean, the things we have in the Bible, if we'll just study, it's absolutely amazing. It will. Uh, it's not some old dry and crusty book but it has the answer for all things right in the Word of God. I want to give a big thank you for John Hall doing our questions tonight. Uh, a big thank you, as always, to John Pounders and Now You See TV for providing this platform. And a big thank you to you, our Midnight Ride listeners you are just the best. We could not do what we do without you. We love you and appreciate you so very much. So until next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody. See you next Saturday night. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.